What's up, hillbillies? We are in Peru, and we are seeing some incredible archaeology behind us, and it's very permaculture based. We're going to be getting to potatoes during the potato trip, but there's some incredible things that we've completely forgotten to time because this Spanish came in and murdered everybody, and so now we don't know what happened. But before that happened, the Incas did some incredible stuff. So we are actually at the top of the beginning of the Sacred Valley. This river here starts here, just really close to the Pacific Ocean, and goes all the way away from the Pacific Ocean, across the entire continent, flows into the Atlantic Ocean, across Brazil. So all of them do, it's kind of crazy. But we're gonna start here, we got our tour guide, Jordan. And again, we have uh, sponsored David from, um, who's an archeologist, uh, I'm not sure if you guys know, archeologists are all very poor. They dedicate their life to uh, getting a very high level degree, which nobody cares for. So either they're university sponsored or they have some other job. And so um, David falls into uh, the different category. And so he's actually uh, works on Wall Street. So, but I'm sponsoring him on the trip. We're gonna go talk about this. So Jordan, what about this valley? Welcome to the first view that we have from the sacred valley of the Incas. One of the most famous, like, favorite spots that the Incas have, or the best spots that you can use the area to farm. Because most of the geography of Peru is just cliffs, very steep parts, and it's not possible to farm in there. So every time when they have these kind of flat areas, and next to them like rivers, they can take advantage of it and use that water to irrigate all that, uh, all that area, and in that way, they take advantage of the nature and create a lot of like farming spots. And you said that the locals now are having issues with the water. Yeah. Right now it's December and you said the rainy season normally starts when? In September, sir. September. Yeah, unfortunately with the global war with the global warming, the global change that is like with the climate is changing a lot. There are like no rain in here. We are like suffering a big, big dry like dry season here in the Andes not only in Cusco, only most of the like cities around Peru. We don't have water. We just, the water like, the water is no like, the raining is no like here for the last three months. And the local people is suffering that. More of the farming areas is completely dry. So, so that's these folks down here. This is modern representations. But you, one thing you had stated was that the traditional Incan farmers, that they're using that, they live up in the mountains that we can't see. Are they having the same issues yeah. with the water? Mm -hmm. So if you look, what you can see is in the sides of these mountains, there's very strange formations. This is, what that is, that's actually ancient agricultural terraces and agricultural fields. The Inca had a process by which to capture rainwater and they would store it at altitude and the soil would retain the moisture and therefore they could have all our agricultural products year round. Unfortunately today, this system is no longer used. Now there is some conversations here in Peru about possibly taking a look about this exact system and bringing it back. Obviously with the Urubamba River being a little bit more dry and the Andean drying effect as well as the global uh, climate change issue, we have to find more different and more sustainable ways. All right, guys, and here we are right by the Pisac Fortress, but this is an agricultural study, and I'm looking at sustainable versions of agriculture. Where we're at is actually crazy. We're allowed access out here because we have a resident archaeologist that I'm sponsoring for the tour, and, of course, someone from the Minister of Tourism, um, but we're able to get access to where most people can't. Up above us, up high, that's where most of the tourists go, We'll be going there later because they have all of the storage and drying facilities. We're looking at ways that people could store their goods and grow food. And so we are allowed access down here on the terrace level, which most people aren't. These terraces might look mundane behind me here. As we can see all the way down in the valley, but there's a lot more going on than what we're looking at. So if you take a look, the very bottom here, you're gonna have crops that are just being introduced. They're gonna start at the bottom. They're gonna be grown. And the most robust one from this year will go up a level. And the robust one from next year will go up a level until it reaches the top. When it reaches the top, it's gonna to pop over here at the lowest level and keep on going up. 
And then when it reaches the top of this whole fortress, then it's gonna go to a higher grade imperial growing facility. And by the time it all makes it all the way up to Cusco, you're gonna have the most robust crops. Also, if you are here and you get a chance to go touring with archeologists, you're gonna have some interesting sites because they're gonna be climbing all over walls and looking over things, which is neat. But yeah, we'll bring you along. So here we're at the bottom and we've got Jor Jordan with us. And uh, can you tell us more about the terraces? Some people might think these are just flat areas that were carved out, but there's much more than that. No, it's more, more, more than that, no? Uh, if you can see all the geography from the Andes, they are more cliffs, like really steep parts, and it's difficult and really like hard to farm in there. So that's why the Incas have to find a solution for that or just to figure out how to, they wanna deal with that. So they have to create flat areas in the cliff of the mountains. And the perfect idea that those guys have were made the terraces. Why? The terraces were so important for three reasons. Not only for farming, also, they give stability for the constructions that are up there in the top of the mountains, in the cities, you know, the cities that they have. It's a perfect drainage system because when it's raining, the rain is going from the first terraces all the way down until the last one. In that way, they irrigate all this area. Also, the terraces can be a perfect division for the agriculture area. They can farm in some of them potatoes, some of them like corn, some of the quinoa, different kind of cereals that we have here in the Andes. So you'll have different ones down here and each one could be either different crops? Exactly. Every of those terraces have different also kind of microclimes. All of that depends on the wind. The wind in the down part is like less windy, it's less windy than the upper part. It's heating less and that makes like the temperature down there is not too cold that now that it is in the upper side. So as they're doing the genetic experiments, if they grow lower and every year it grows up and it moves up a terrace and up a terrace, then by the time it gets to the top, it has wind resistance and lower moisture content crops? Exactly, yeah. That's incredible. It's incredible. And so what's the construction here? I know you have a diagram. Here we can identify that like, the terraces is not in a flat area. It's just going in the cliff, like in the steep parts. You put the big stones in the bottom, then less, like, less bigger, no? The gravel, then you can put sand and then the soil. So it looks like there's lots of soil here, but really this is just a small amount of topsoil. Exactly. And the rest you see the water come, trickles down, permeates yeah. through and right onto the next terrace. Exactly. If you just have like normal cliff of the mountains without this structure, the water just flows down. No stop in the terraces. So the terraces that you create like the flat area, when it makes like the water, gonna go like in circles here and takes more time in this area then pass to the next one. So when we're talking about the modern farming, mm -hmm. they have no water control. You can see the erosion gullies cutting down there. The water hits, it goes straight down to the Urubamba, uh -huh. and then it makes its way to the Atlantic Ocean. Exactly, yeah. But here on this old site, the water is retained, exactly. slowed, spread, and it's soaking it over time. Exactly. So even in a dry season when it doesn't rain often, then yeah. you can still grow co crops. Exactly, yeah. But the modern growers down there, that's green. They're using flood uh, irrigation. Flood irrigation, so when it doesn't rain. They have problems. Now all of a sudden, all of this irrigation has no water. Right. They're <laughs> using pumps to pull it up there. As opposed to the old system, it, it's all natural gravity fed. Mm -hmm. So it's more exactly. robust. More robust. Mm -hmm. That has more outputs, but it's more fragile. This has less outputs, but it's far more robust and sustainable. Yeah, like exactly. We have also we have to see. Uh, we have to know that we are in a different month now. It's supposed to be the rainy season. And now it's more rivers in the other side of the mountain. That was, that's why the green areas is all there. But in here, in this part of the mountains, in, in June, July, or in August, this part is more green because we have more rivers in the upper side of the mountain. And those rivers like irrigate all this area. This was that's a wealthy it. fortress. Exactly. So these old systems, which this is not, if you look at this system, every bit of like, just like you look, if you look at an ancient Roman road, it's not just a stone, right? Everything has a purpose. Every bit of what you see that seems eroded, just little cracks, right? 
little tiny terraces. Every bit of that looked just like this before. And that is an incredible amount of infrastructure. And everything they did for that infrastructure was for the purpose of food production. Incredible. Because human beings fought and killed each other forever for all of humanity for food. And now we're trying to uh, make sure, you know, on a very fragile system, attempting to grow for all of the world. Interesting what we've uh, uncreated. Jordan, you were just saying something very interesting about uh, these fortress in the city up there and about these terraces. They're not just for agriculture. What else are they? Also, they are like sustained for the, all the buildings that we have in the upper side. The observatory, the astronomy place, the fortress that we have up there. Each terrace is sustained from the other, side, other one that is in the upside. They're foundational. They are the foundations on which the city is built. You'll see the same thing at Machu Picchu. Exactly. So there's a foundation. Of, so what's down? So how did they build them? They start the building at the bottom. So the bottom was the first part that they have to build from the bottom to the upper side. So they had to build from there. So you can't just start up there and build down. No, they started down there years before. Exactly, because if you start the buildings up there, they won't collapse one day because they don't have sustain. The so everyone holds the one above it that holds the next one. All of that weight is in one mass that's supporting the city. Exactly. So we didn't come to Peru for no reason. We got Jordan, our tour guide, is incredible. We've already showed you about the terraces in general, but something super cool is in this picture, you're gonna see little juts off. Now people might think that that's for irrigation, like a gutter system. That's not the case. What are they? They are stairs to climb different, different terraces to the next one. So here's, a, here's actually some of these stairs. Yeah. Because some of the terraces are like 10 feet, 11 feet high. So it's difficult just to climb the walls. So in order to know, go around, guys have to make like this kind of stairs to pass to the other terraces. So we were talking about the infrastructure a moment ago, but if you actually get up close to that wall, this is impressive agriculture. You're on video, it might look small, but uh, this is actually one of the smaller terraces. We're sitting in it and this is, we're standing in it right now and this terrace is actually super, super wide and super tall. This is only shorter because we're at a transition point where the stairs are at. Everywhere else, maybe they're two, uh, 2.5 of Jordan's height is how tall these are. So this is an incredible amount of infrastructure. So what you see, the runoffs from that picture, that is not actually places for water to go. So that begs the question, how do they capture water and where does the water go? Well, we'll see if we can explain that. All right, so here we are, and in the terrace, you can see there's a bit of an erosion gully creek right here. But right here is actually, the land is in a, approximately a U shape. We're gonna see if we can show you what that looks like from ground level. As you come up, it's in a U. So as it's raining, the rain water hits this, the water flows to the center, then it percolates through that structure that we just showed you. Then that structure will want to follow gravity down into the next terrace. So every bit of these is water harvesting and collection structures. So there is there is two uh, levels to this piece of engineering. The first level is exactly what you're talking about. So the dip, the U shape, if you look on the side of the terrace on the wall is high. And on the edge of the terrace is also higher than the center. So what happens is that's designed to capture rainwater as it's coming down. However, if you have a really strong storm where not all the rainwater can be immediately captured in the center of the terrace, then that's what you see if you come to the edge of this terrace. You see that what happens is there is a gradual drop off into the next terrace and then the one after and the one after. So this is for overflow. This is a flash flood event where these are mini ponds and then they gently go over. Yeah, they overflow. And if you look on the side of that mountain, even if you have the strongest of the flash floods, all the water will be absorbed and maintained by this system by the time it gets down to the lower terraces. It's all water control. Now, let's take a look across the valley at those erosion gullies. Those look relatively new. Because they were not maintained, now they are gathering water, water flushes down. It's eroding all the topsoil. All that's being stripped down into this river, which is then gonna make its way to the Urubamba, and then into the, into the ocean, right from here. So the Inca Empire accounted for genius problem solving, where they captured the slow spread and soaked water, but they accounted for the unpredictable rainwater events with flash floods. Then that water sunk into the ground, and 
brought balance to the yard. They're balancing the rainwater. So here's actually Pisac. That's, uh, that's how all the terraces are designed. You can see it there. Each one might be for a different crop. And then here at the very top is actually where the city and fortress are and the food preservations. And so that's actually where we're going to go next. Yeah, yeah so um, the water system, as we were explaining, the, the, the way the water is washed away from the city, what it does is actually it keeps the city dry as well. And it keeps the, the main foundations of the city stable. So, it, so they're controlling the water, but they don't want it to be too wet. So the foundations can actually stay and support the city. Yeah, so you don't have mudslides um, on Inca archaeological sites. It doesn't happen. So mudslides are a thing. So, so all that's this... why the city, if you look, by all rights, the city should have collapsed in the 600 years that it has not been maintained. But yet it's not collapsed. Not only is it not collapsed, it's perfectly preserved. And the reason for it is because its foundations are strong. And the system to take water, excess water away from it is a very clever and ingenious system. So David pointed out as we were walking past, I would not have known. I would have thought this was a wall that was built when they built this road. No, this is an original Inca terrace that was never maintained. Can't quite communicate how steep this is, but this is approximately level. And this hillside is going up like this with the terracing system. So they even made use of this, this steep of land by terracing it. Very incredible. All right, so now we are at a different site with different types of terraces behind us. Can you tell us about the terraces? Well, we stay now in the Ollantaytambo archaeological site. And we can identify different kinds of terraces down there in the bottom. But those terraces no were proper for agriculture. They were proper just to give only sustain to the buildings that we have up here in the mountains. So it's a foundation mm -hmm. and a military fortress. Exactly, military fortress. That's the only place in all South America that the Incas beat the Spanish people. They were defending this area. They were defending their traditions here for more than three weeks in a row. One point they just were defeated by the Spanish people. But they, but they held out for super long. Exactly, yeah. They were supporting a lot this time. And then on this side here, we have the Oyo de Tantambo. Yeah. Then uh, over here, we actually have the agriculture terraces across the way. So we have modern farming down here, flood irrigation from the Uribamba. From the Bamba River. And if we just see in front of this place, there is one path that is going to the, to the right, right up there in the mountains, because that path is going to the quarry. The quarry, in order to make this place, is like just five miles away. You can see this light massive rocks, like big rocks up here. They bring, they brought all the rocks from there. All the way up and over that ridge, right? Exactly, all the way up to there, all the way up to here. To here. From the bottom to this. And if to you see this, these are, this is actually a smaller version of the stone, but that's uh, the size of a person, much larger. <laughs> so there's some terraces that are in use over there, the ancient terraces that have been restored. Why do they get to use that versus what we just saw at Pisac? Oh, because the government no have control of those terraces. That land, like, they have their own owner, yeah, and they belong to someone else, and that guy have, can take advantage and use those terraces for farming. Instead of the places that are controlled by the government, like the archaeological site that we were being before the Pisa or the Antitambo. So the Peruvian government is, like, getting a, a price for the tickets to get inside to those areas, and they preserve that. Because of their preserving, it's not possible for the local people to use the terraces for farming anymore. So the terraces that you can sell tickets to get, that's the difference. Versus this is just a private landowner. Exactly. They have some ancient Inca terraces. They said, this is good. I am a farmer. I'm going to put them in the back of the production. Exactly, yeah. And the Peruvian government respect that. Incredible. You are the private area. You can like farming in your own area. The terraces, the big ones, can also use for work. So this was not, these terraces were not used for farming, but down here at the bottom, which we're gonna get up closest, they're actually doing potato farming on these terraces right now. It's a local potato that you never find anywhere else. But uh, they have local folks, local people are farming them, correct? Yeah, farming. And they have a permission or access to do that because of the government want to show that it's possible also to farming in this kind of terraces. You can continue to farm even though it's for super old. Exactly, after 500 years that the Incas left this area. By the way, the potato farming operation is down there. 
but every major Inca city was also in the shape sacred to them, and Oya Tantambo is in the shape of maize, or we would know it as corn. So it's actually a stalk of corn, an oval that juts that way. But what I wanted to show you guys is over across the way, there's two gods. One god is right there. There's the eyes, the mouth, and the beard. But here is the colpas, which is the drying and storage facility. All the farms around here would bring their food to be dried there and then there's, stored. There's several facilities, several colpa facilities. There's an entire facility there. So there's, there's colpas. A massive, there's That's... a massive facility there. It's one of the largest in the Inca Empire right there in the center. And then further up, there is another colpa. And all these are positioned over there because they collect a lot of wind. They knew that. So even though people didn't live there, they lived over here. This was also a fortress, or they lived in the town. They also lived in the town. So if you look, actually, you can see there is remnants of, of Inca mm. architecture. So if you, you can if see you follow my finger over there, follow my finger there. And if you look in these houses at the bottom, and we'll probably show you guys that a little bit more up close, but the, this entire town is a heritage site. These houses may look semi-modern, but all their foundations are Inca. That's because this, the shape and the fabric of this town has not changed. So they, it's pre-Spanish times. And they just left it that way. So you have all the farmers, but then strategically they built all of the culpas, the culpas up high and uh, collected all the wind to use it for drying purposes. So just an incredible use of the landscape to do the work for you. We're on top of the hill now. We have these massive stones here. They're in the process of like works, no? And here, this size, That's you have huge. the first view of the sun temple here this is the sun temple and here we can identify exactly probably it's more than 12 feet they were starting to build this yeah. and then there was a story of uh, a general yeah. in the politic division that we have from the incas no was possible that one member of the royalty have a relationship with one part of the nobles but one day one general from the army have a secret relationship with the, sister, the daughter of one of the Incas. So these guys decided to run away and they were like here, hiding here, fighting with the Incas army for more than two weeks. So for two weeks, there were 12 loyal Inca soldiers to that general and they brought an Inca army of 2,000 and they held them off here and this was supposed to be a temple. Well, after they finally killed that guy, they yeah. said, why don't we turn this into a fortress? So they stopped the building. They stopped uh, the building, and they just decided to create better uh, fortress than a temple. And that's when this became the Ollantaytambo. Now they killed him, but then they named it after him afterwards. Exactly. The name of that general was called Ollantay. So they changed the name that they have used to have this to Ollantaytambo. So the fortress of Ollantay. No? Crazy love triangles. Exactly. <laughs> Alright, this is a hydrology segment that we're doing. All of the Inca cities and areas, they care about water first and foremost about everything. Yeah. Secondarily, they care about the building around them. So they'll move everything around the water. They'll build everything around the way the water flows across the land. They'll carve it. All the things in the archaeological sites for the Incas works around the water because the water was the most essential thing for create, for farming areas, for the fertility of the mother earth, for the ground. And every time with the work, soldiers here have to work, they have to purify their bodies, clean their stuff, and they, they can work in this kind of buildings. That's why they were considered sacred day. water. They have to supposed to take a shower here and they, they can move it. And the showers in the bath. Exactly, like a Absolutely. ceremonial fountain. And in this also, in this kind of fountains, the Incas, used to like receive the water from the mother earth in order to make their like cook in order to like irrigate also these kind of areas the water was considered really important for us and they supposed to be this the water temple it's one ceremonial fountain the only one in this city that is located in one place like this <laughs> and we can see here after 500 years the water still flows. So 500 years, no one's doing anything. No one's doing anything, and the water still have a lot of strength. There are many communities in the Sacred Valley whose 
fire, main form of plumbing is still the Inca aqueduct system. And the aqueduct system is working perfectly after 500 years. This water is cold and clean. Cold, clean, and came from all the way to the top of the mountain. After irrigating everything, came here for washing purposes, and it's probably going to do a bunch more before it reaches the bottom of the valley. Exactly. You were talking about potatoes a moment ago. This video is about potatoes. And so you're saying, what kind of potatoes can you find in the marketplace versus in the local communities? In a marketplace, you can find, you can identify like 10 varieties of potato normally, but in the communities, they have more than 100, 120 varieties of potato. Why don't have the same one? Because there are some more famous in Cusco, in the city, in the town, that those communities just and so where are we standing right now, guys? So we are standing in a culpa. This is a traditional agriculture facility. This, this is specifically a storage facility for agricultural products. Um, the best way I can explain it is this is a natural cold storage facility that was constructed by the Inca. If you walk along, now this, this particular culpa has where, been reconstructed. Where were we earlier? Earlier we were down there in the terraces. And was there wind down there when we were down there? No, there's a lot of wind here. You, you, you can look at that flag over there, you can see that there is wind consistently coming towards this culpa. And how did they use that with these? So if you come, walk with me here. So the dead giveaway that we can identify these particular structures is three large trapezoidal doors. Here is one of them. There is another one right here. And there is a third one right here. And they're equidistantly placed. The distances between them and the corners of the building are the same. And they have a really important purpose. What they do is they collect wind. They allow wind to come into here and circulate through the structure when it was when it was actually completed. And was there a roof where we're at? There was a roof. It would have been a thatched roof made from and the natural Andean grass, which we can show you a little bit later. The temperature in this facility would have been around 45 degrees when functional. And it would have been used not to only keep produce, but also to dry produce, to turn potatoes into chuños, for example. So the traditional dry potato. So they're catching the wind off the ridges. It comes in. Yeah, if you, come, if you come and look at this flag, you can actually see how it's, the wind is always coming into this building. And you may not be able to, but you can feel it on your... So the wind's coming in. This is an enclosed structure. There's piles of food here. Here. Oh, here, against here. Yeah, here. And, and then the, what's the, happening is the wind is coming in and circulating. Circulates up and circulating. And then it eventually will go up and out the top, right? Yeah, so there is a, it's a circular pattern for the wind in this building. And basically, if you can dehydrate your potatoes at that temperature, you're making, what was the name of the potatoes? Chuños. So chuños are still used today, but you're basically dehydrating potatoes over the course of three weeks in here, and they'll last for five, 600 years. We, have, we do find them on archaeological sites. Now, the interesting thing is there has to be a very specific climate and altitude for that to happen. Because if you try to, if you try to do the same thing in almost anywhere in the United States, they're going to go bad. The potatoes are going to go bad. You need to be at this altitude, with this climate, with this wind, to dehydrate the potato as opposed to allow it to spoil. So the potato that's dehydrated once it's dehydrated, it can go anywhere as long as it's maintained yeah, in the same Once place. it's dehydrated, it just, it's stable. So it's we, could, stable. we could build a machine that mimics this in any climate and dehydrate in our theory. food indefinitely. In theory. So we started from the bottom and now we're here, which is the top of the observatory in Pisac. So Jordan? We are in the highest spot of this city, the perfect location for see the idols that the Incas have, the stars, the moon, the sun. Remember that those guys get information from the constellations about which kind of plants they can farm in here, in this side of the mountain, with the other side that we can still have some terraces of, over there. And we are in the upper part that we can see, this is the part that the nobles used to live. In the downside, we have four structures that they used to live, the farmers, the guys who were in status. So the lower you were in status, the, the lower, lower you lived. lived. Even though there's that, and then all of the agriculture, where we first came with Corpas, was over there, where they kept all the food and, and processed it. And interesting... And also uh, industrial activity, artisanal activity would have gone on. Industrial, ar artisanal activity. 
Behind us, you have the necropolis. The, the, the necropolis, which is where everyone was buried, yeah. which is very impressive. But all you can see everything around us, even higher than we're at, is all unexcavated terraces. Terraces that used to look like this. When the Spanish came, they actually wanted to maintain all of this intact, uh, but all the knowledge was in Quechua. And what happened then? Oh, so the Spanish people decide to put like new rules in Cusco City. That means that the people can't continue speaking in Quechua and they have to learn Spanish. So the elder guys, the old guys, die before they pass the information to the next generations. In that way, we lost a lot of history. Because everybody, all the people who built all of this, then knows how to do it. It was all in Quechuan, but they weren't allowed to speak it. Exactly. For the cronies, the first authors of the books about the Incas, they took more than 60 years to just understand the native language, the Quechua language. Wow, so all of this, even though we're in a noble site, the entire civilization revolves around agriculture the main source of currency so taxes and tribute to the empire the emperor and the empire were paid in agricultural products and stable crops um, so you didn't so you so you didn't have money you you traded grains yeah and you paid your taxes in grains and the emperor uh, it was a social contract in which the uh, the community paid a share of their crops to the empire and the emperor and the emperor had the responsibility of maintaining seeds for the entire empire that was the main responsibility of the emperor is to make sure every planting season there was more than ample seeds available that would be given freely to the farming class so that they could continue the society so everybody paid taxes and grains that was collected by the empire to use but they had to be responsible with it to make sure that it they could be there reused. was enough seed for the next plant. Well, that's incredible. All right, so we're inside the city of Oyaitantambo now. And this is a flowing active aqueduct. It's always flowing. This is 500 years later. Yeah, this is, so this is Oyaitantambo. Yeah. It's a really interesting place, the city. You can see that the, what the? So no, that's original Inca. Inca so foundations that many of the buildings retain their Inca foundations and their shape during Inca times, as well as the natural hydraulic system of the city, which is not only preserved, but perfectly functional after 500 years. And this is, it goes, it drops down, disappears, and pops out somewhere else in the city. Yep, it's oh. going under the ground, and then connecting this part to the other side. The other side of the city will have the water. So not only is it a form of water carrying, for the city as, a, as the infrastructure of the city, all this water flows into the agricultural part. So the very the last place. bit is after the city, before it gets to the Urubamba, it actually makes it to... It irrigates the entire, agro, the entire productive agricultural sides of the city. So at the very top, they're capturing the water in terraces, <coughs> using it, using it, using it, funneling it, using it all the way down. Now we're what, several kilometers below it. They're using it some more until they continue to use it right at the very end. And then it actually makes it its way into the Urubamba. The water that is coming also from the terrace after they join to another river that is in the right side. This river like, is like clean and the water, and the water that these people have in the city, they use it not only for farming, also they use it for cleaning. So this is all their cleaning and drinking and cooking water. Exactly. Still today. Still, well, 500 years later. If you touch it, it's clean cold water. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right, here we are at the top of that. It looks like it's coming out of nowhere, but it actually is, under is, this is original Inca building. underground. We have an Inca building. This and, uh, is still working perfectly. Here it is coming from the side, all the way down from where it was captured, way, way, way up there. And all this, so if you look from here, the foundations of this entire block of houses is original Inca. And these were houses of nobility in Oyan Taitambo. Exactly. These were very important people in the city. You're a very important person in the city. <laughs> we are. All right, so here we are again. The entire city, which is like laid out like maze of corns. We're on the outside of the oval. We've got Oyo Oyo Tadnambo Fortress over there. 
here's the hydraulic that's still working and running that you're getting everything but, but again most interestingly is how well preserved this is the best continuously occupied and preserved inca city in the entire uh, country of peru you can see that the double jam doors like this one which was a sign of extremely high status including the large lentils are oh, still in know. use um and and it's functioning as the as the practical door of this person's house and you can see that people still live here they they're allowed to live they can't modify the original structure but they can build on top but no more than two stories but they're going to live within the original inca structure yeah. and that's still allowed i'm going to show you a, a street here and this is things that most people miss in Oyotanambo. look at the state of preservation and there's completely there's no wind no wind at all and you can see the ruins of the Inca agricultural processing facility right over on the hill. That's that right there. So people lived here. And they continue to live here. And everything you see on both sides of the street is Inca. This is all original. And continues to be occupied. Anywhere you see mortar like this is a reconstruction. But they use the same initial stones. But down here where, the, the bottom, where there is no, no mortar, that is all original. And as we continue down, we see again the colpas with agriculture processing. Here we are on the other side of the town, effectively. And there's the agricultural hydrology that drives the entire town. And again, it's, it's an oval shape like a piece of corn and the town just juts that way. And that's where people get on when they're going to Machu Picchu. We are in Chinchero. Everyone here dresses as traditional, but I want to show you the gutter systems. Again, everything is designed around the water from these cities. So we are in a palace. Uh, the Incas burned it down uh, to prevent the Spanish from uh, getting resources as they were fleeing. But this is basically tons of resources and all these are all farming terraces out here, out this way just incredible and then this some buildings all. all of the uh again the water they don't want the water just going willy-nilly wherever it wants to go the purpose of this water system what this does is it just takes the water away from uh where they don't want it from the top of the hill you can see you can see how it's to draw water away from the foundations and what it does is it you can see it there it pushes the water into the agricultural terraces it you're pulling water from where it doesn't want to go and move it to where you do want it, exactly. so which this, is... This goes, this goes and this feeds this entire agricultural terrace. And here we are on the top of terrace after terrace after terrace. Massive terrace. And off, way off in the distance, we'll see if we can see that. Way off in the distance, you can see terraces on the hillside. Hey, good morning. We stay now in Chinchero. Chinchero is one of the most beautiful places that we have in all the capital, close to Cusco. We will look around, these beautiful buildings have a beautiful style, beautiful technique, that the Incas put more effort there. They are just rock and by rocks, no, no mat, nothing in the middle. There is, was a big palace that Tupac Yupanqui, the 10 Inca made for himself. Once a time he retired, he can rest from still conquer the empire to like, still be here and be in peace for the last days that of this guy no so in, also in that side we have some of the big terraces big farming areas those guys used to farm different kind of Andean cereals like potatoes like quinoa like wheat like the barley as well and around us also there are many terraces in the upper side that were collapsed because they Peruvian were no maintained those only this archaeological site. Yeah, so you can see here, it's interesting. You have farmers, modern farmers, have destroyed and removed some of the terraces to make it easier for equipment. But all of this on all the mountainsides around us has the initial terraces that are in place. From the top to the bottom, you can see that there's terraces from the top of this hillside all the way down to the bottom. If you actually look at that mountainside, you'll see terraces going up the mountain. Same thing with this hillside. You can see that there was terraces in ancient times. They have been collapsed. Some of the terraces on the top tier of this hill are still in use. The terraces up there are still in use. They're productive. If you come down here, 
you'll see that there is what used to be terraces that has been leveled off by the farmers that are still being used for agriculture and right behind them there is remnants of ancient terraces that have collapsed. So the important thing is this the city of Chinchero was a royal center and as any royal center in the Inca Empire it, the cities were expected to provide their own source of water and be completely self-sustaining in their source of food. So what you see is an entire landscape around the city that was transformed by the Inca to provide for the agricultural needs of the city. What was the population of the city? It is difficult to estimate population. There was a study done in the 90s about the agricultural output of the Sacred Valley. And what we think is that at the height of the empire, this area of the empire would have been able to sustain a population three to four times its current population, which would have been a massive, massive population. And it's, and it's evident if you, uh, as, as we drive through the Sacred Valley, we'll show you, but almost all the mountainsides, you're going to see those same parallel lines, which are basically remnants of collapsed ancient terraces. It shows you that this entire landscape was once farmed to a much, much greater extent than it is today. And all the eucalyptus trees we see, uh, none of that was here, right? The Spanish introduced it as that an- That is correct. So this is a, this is a uh, type of tree that the Spanish brought specifically for construction needs. Because it the, grows quickly. Yes, in the post-colonial period. And unfortunately, it's become invasive in the Sacred Valley today. It, uh, it has, uh, because it uses so much water, it is suffocating the, the native trees out of existence. So you have a eucalyptus tree and a native tree. Its roots are going to go deeper. It's going to be better well established. And it's a double-edged sword. One, it's killing all the native populations. But two, it's preventing erosion from the hillside because no one's maintaining the hillside now. That's correct. That's correct. And uh, so, but again, look at all of this and I want you to quantify in, in gallons or liters, how much rainwater collection, keeping it and storing all the water up high. I mean, that's, those are full blown mountainsides and, uh, and how much um, more robust, they're still growing random shrubs and stuff up there, retaining the water instead of allowing to hit, that and, go all and the way down. The collapsed terraces. So these terraces are nowhere near as productive they would have been if they had been maintained. Right. Uh, and uh, an interesting part about Inca civilization and Inca culture is a complete um, harmony with nature. And it's something that survives today in Andean religion. And you can see it. Nature, Mother Nature, uh, Pachamama, as she is called in Andean religion, she provides. If you, I mean, they believe, you know, yeah. Jordan can talk more about that, but they believe that if you if you respect her, she will provide you. Exactly, it's a reciprocity. You respect the Pachamama, the Pachamama will give you all the resources that you need to continue to stay alive. We will production like that. Exactly. And compare that with water capture, slowing it, soaking it in, rehydrating all the aquifers to make sure there's always enough water in the city, to the same hillside that was in production, which is dependent on modern irrigation, and then when you suddenly have a dry season, there's no more water. They can't pump the water here. They're disrupting this topsoil, all that good stuff. This is a lot more fragile. It may be more productive, but it's a lot more fragile. Also, one thing that I want to point out is the close relationship, both in terms of religious and political purposes between agriculture and the state in Inca times. What we are standing in, if you want to pan out, we are standing in a massive plaza. This is a plaza that existed during Inca times. And the uh, structure behind you is a massive, massive imperial palace. You can tell because of its huge gatehouses. This was an extremely important site for the emperor. And this plaza would have been used for the most important gatherings or religious festivals, such as in Tiraimi, the great festival of the sun god. Uh, it would have also been used to assemble great numbers of people for the emperor to declare decrees, uh, change laws. And the interesting thing about it is this is a, this is a heart, a political heart of the empire and it butts up to an agricultural landscape. As in literally, as I step off this plaza, I enter an agricultural landscape. And you can see even the remnants of the water system that would have existed. And if, if, you, if you look at the terraces down there, if you want to step here and look at the, the terrace system 
than with the 90 degree angles down there, it's the same thing. It shows you how closely related agriculture was to the political heart of the state. Back in the day, in Inca times, taxes, there was no money. Taxes was paid in food. Food was the currency. And so they were very serious about taking natural resources and weaponizing natural landscapes and things like gravity to produce food in, in a mass. In a harmonious way. In a completely harmonious way. As opposed to having to do high input stuff like what we see across from here now. So we're in Chincheros. So we can't this see is a major uh, agricultural palace. Remember back in the day it was there. I wanted to show you some potato farming that's actively happening down the river valley. So it's actually really, really interesting because this is private property where there's just people living their life, growing food, and as you can tell, it butts up to it, the archaeological site. They, and that's actually part of the archaeological site in a way. That, that's where would have, they would have been farmed in, in ancient times. And so they're, they're farming down there because down there is the only flat spot and probably where all the water is at. And But here you can see the terraces. This would have all been farmable and then all of the water would have been captured at the top, slow spread and soaked all the way down. So each one gets varying degrees, but controlled degrees of liquid, of water to be able to grow. Uh, but here we are, we have potatoes, we have some beans. I don't see any corn down there. No, I think it's potato several different types of potatoes and beans. Yeah, so, but it's really interesting. It's super neat to just see someone living their life that butts up against it. And, just uh, majesty. There's the, no, not even a fence. The Inca had a concept of crop rotation. Exactly, yeah. Similar to what exists today. They believed, and it, it also was a religious concept, they believed that the land needed to be rested. Exactly. For three years, right? Exactly. So they now use all these terraces for farming every year. They use some of them. They choose, according also with the seasons that we have, some of them works for some years, three years, generally in a row, and they, they rest, let them rest for three years as well. And they so three well. years on, three years off. Yeah. So all of this isn't constantly in production. They're rotating crops through, and they're rotating animals through. In the meantime, the animals will be pooping. Yeah, pooping, so they would run grass. alpaca and llamas and as a form of fertilizer. The way, this area, too. So they're rebuilding all of the. Because remember, all of this is hillside. They had to be recreated. They actually maintained exactly. the soil very specifically. And they understood that you can't plant the same. Even when you rest the land, you can't keep planting the same crop. They would rotate between potatoes, between beans between maize and this process would continue and you i think you said uh something about they would be planting corn for three years and the fourth year if they planted that same corn then yeah. it'd be much smaller yeah exactly so in the beginning they plant like they soil fertilize the, the grasses the corn will be like huge like probably six seven feet big <clears throat> but if they continue planting in the four year the air no will be the same because no have rest. So the corn will not like just grow up at three or four feet. No will be like huge corn that we used to have in the sacred valley. And they also believed in selective breeding. So they understood that if you had a crop that was robust, because this is not the natural climate or altitude for corn. Mm -hmm. So it's only a special type of corn that can grow here. And that had to be selectively bred. What they would do is they would plant a crop, whatever crop, and the strongest of that crop, the most robust of that crop, that would be the seed that would be maintained for the next planting season. And they would do this consistently. And that they would start at the bottom. And then the best crop at the bottom would move up the next one, year. Yeah, it would move up Then one that would be step. saved one more time and it would be move moved up, up one, one step. more step. Yeah. And so they're just doing, they're planting in mass. It's genetic selection. This is very, uh, similar to how the potatoes, the, the russet potato came about, I think, where there's a guy who wasn't college educated and came up with a Macintosh apple, all kinds of varieties, because it grew the best, as opposed to all the genetics today. Geneticists, they're being hired by large companies, and they basically are trying to create the same monocrop. But they, all of that also had a religious purpose and meaning for it. Their entire agricultural science was also completely tied into their religion. Hold up. What? What the fuck? All right, here we are in Chinchero again. We, the terraces we just looked at were over there. But one crazy thing over here, this is the palace, largest continuous structure. People are talking about how it's, you know, Machu Picchu is impressive. People don't even know about this site, really. And uh, it's the largest continuous royal Inca 
pattern here, but uh, that's not what we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about the control and mastery of water. Yeah, so um, we actually have a really great example of both uh, hydraulic engineering as well as agricultural use of water here. So as you can see, this is a massive, massive wall. However, the Inca knew that they needed to take water away from here, from the structure itself, so that the foundations are sound. If you come closer, you can see in this rock, there is a spout. There is an opening. The impressive thing is under this building of monumental stones, there is an entire channel system that is designed to take water away from the building. The water would have come out that spout, and if you actually go get close, you can see there's calcium in there's calcite that has formed when this um, system was in uh, in use the water would have come down and there's a very specific design ingredient here so that this water comes down in a controlled manner it's not just gushing out it comes down in a control manner you can see the remnants of the channels that were used to take this water away from the palace it goes in both directions it goes in both directions from here, almost at a 90 degree angle. And what it does is it then irrigates the terraces on both sides of the palace. And that water is retained in those terraces for agricultural use. So complete mastery would be moving water away from all the structures, keeping the foundations dry, but they're not wasting it. They're not just like our gutter systems today, get the water off the roof, throw it into the valley, throw it onto the street, storm drains, take it to the ocean. This is, let's make use of the water. So every site, and again, what Jordan was just talking about earlier, the biggest thing is self-sustaining. You have to be able to build everything to be able to grow enough food and have enough water to exist. Otherwise, they didn't build there. They would build somewhere else. They would not pick a site selection for there. That was the most important thing. So we are at a really interesting place in Chinchero. As we talked about, um, the Inca used water for several purposes. We already saw the agricultural use of the water. However, here we have an example of a domestic use of water. So you can see rainwater is collected. It comes through this channel. Again, the angle is purposeful. This is not by accident, this is by design. What was the purpose of the angle? Is to make sure the water flows at a, at a constant and specific speed. Why? Why would you care? So that it doesn't gush out and cause problems. And here we have two reservoirs, two water storage facilities. One is filled in, but one is actually still in existence and you can come see the construction of it. It's using monumental stones and currently it's a home to frogs. Um, yeah, there's a lot of frogs in there and tadpoles. Big old frogs. Yeah, big old frogs. But here you can actually see the spout where the water would have flown, uh, would have um, come in and then been divided between these two reservoirs. And so and what's making this water tight is this one big stone that's been carved. Yeah, so, well, I mean, this is, there's been reconstruction, but this is, uh, this, this is probably fairly deep. And this would not have been open like this. This would not have been open to the elements. This would have been a covered reservoir, most likely. So what people would come here with pots or something to get water yeah they would get water the construction that would have been over this was probably made up of um, wood and grass which of course when the city was burned by the Inca to deny it to the Spanish would have been burned as well and then it looks like there's an overflow channel here which is buried yep that's correct which then continues onward so that it can agricultural, agricultural use I'm not sure if these are local farmers or whatnot but you can still see and you can see this in Machu Picchu um, where people are still using the animals to graze. And uh, it looks like here they're using some sheep. And using the sheep to graze will basically allow them to keep the grass nice and short without having the human labor. You're feeding the sheep and it's just a good use of system. Also, not sure if you can tell, there's little black dots everywhere. That's poop, sheep's poop and it's being pelletized, fertilizer for free is going down. <sighs> There's a pig there, it looks like it's chained in place. Not sure how often it's moved, uh, but it's not ringed. And so you see uh, more- That's a shrine. Um, uh, more destruction really under the pig a little bit. That's as opposed a to 
the grazing, the gentle grazing. Right. So a, a lot of the terraces are still being used this is where by animals that have been to graze and fertilize human, during the crop rotation. Because again, they were using annual crops. Now they were using annual crops, not perennial strike. crops predominantly, because they were mainly cereals, like right? It's a annual, up. an annual's job is to go in, cover the bare soil, produce as many seeds as it can and die. And that's its generational contribution. So we just found out as humans that you could take and store those seeds for one period of time. That water section we just shot was just around the other side of this. And this is a waka. A waka is a, a religious shrine. And this one is most likely a fertility shrine. It's, it's near a water source and it's near agricultural terraces. It's very typical for fertility shrines to be located toward, towards both. This was probably a fertility shrine because it's by a water source yeah. and that it is uh, and here's an uh, altar where offerings could have been made and unlike what most people believe it would not have been human offerings this would have uh been generally agricultural offerings so like corn corn potato and coca leaves, coca leaves. always coca leaves. always coca leaves mm -hmm. if you want to have a modern day representation of this you can probably think of a lot of chinese cultures uh not not in uh red china but if you look in hong kong uh, and in Taiwan, where the culture, the actual ancient cultures still exist, they have their little temples in their house. Everyone has a temple in their house and they give fruits and vegetables and they change them out as a way of thanks or uh, for luck. Uh, so yes, fertility did have to do with, with having children, but in, in the Inca uh, milieu, it has much more to do with agriculture. Boom, bam,